Hello, everyone. Welcome to Global Conversations, a lecture series organized by the Department of Eastern Christian Studies here at University College Stockholm. We are here this evening to discuss a very important issue, the prospects of Sweden joining the NATO alliance in the near future. And of course, this question is extremely important for Swedish society, but it is also very important for Europe and has important implications for the rest of the world as well. Some of my colleagues and myself feel that this issue has not been properly discussed, not yet at least in the public realm, and that the mainstream media have already set the parameters for how to think about this question without actually providing sufficient space for free discussion, open discussion that could be the basis for making an informed decision which would have some democratic legitimacy. So this uh, event this evening is meant to compensate at least in part for this lack. And we are very happy and honored to have uh, Noam Chomsky with us today, the world's preeminent thinker who will help us unpack this question and the related issues. There is no need to introduce Noam Chomsky. If that name is not familiar to you, that probably means that you overslept half a century of intellectual history and no introduction can compensate uh, for that. So without further ado, uh, I would go straight to our uh, today's conversation. Thank you, Noam, for being with us today. Uh, welcome to Global Conversations and welcome to University College Stockholm. Yeah. Well, I'm going to take seriously the phrase open conversations. I'd like to leave this mostly to discussion, so I'll just say a couple of words. Actually, I don't really have a great deal to say about the question of Sweden, also Finland, uh, and NATO. A mostly puzzlement. I'll be brief and I hope the discussion will help me to resolve my apparent misunderstanding. Uh, the puzzles have to do with what seems to be a contradiction. So two ideas uh, predominate in Western discourse concerning these matters. The first idea is unrestrained gloating over Putin's demonstration that the Russian military is a paper tiger. It's incapable even of conquering cities a few kilometers from its border that are defended by a mostly citizen's army. So great excitement about the exposure of the fact that this is a totally incompetent military force. That's one idea. The other idea is that we must cower in terror before this awesome military machine, which is about to attack and overwhelm anyone on its, everyone on its path, even though it plainly has no capacity to do so and has never even hinted at such a thought. Never mind. We must arm ourselves to the teeth. We must join the most powerful military machine force in world history, a military alliance that of course pretends to be defensive as all military forces do, but is plainly an offensive force as its record clearly demonstrates. And of course its core military component, US, UK, that's the military base for NATO. Oh, they have a long record up to the present of aggression, violence, and subversion. But we have to do this, heightening tensions to protect ourselves from the paper tiger that is so incompetent it can't conquer cities a couple of kilometers from its border that are not even defended by a major army, citizen's army. Well, something seems to be amiss. Uh, maybe you can explain it to me. Uh, all that aside, uh, Sweden and Finland are substantial military powers. 
not on the scale of the United States and Britain, but quite substantial. Co according to military sources, which I'll now be quoting, Atlantic Council, Finland has the largest reserve force in Europe and can mobilize 280,000 troops. Still quoting its decision last year to replace its F-18 combat aircraft with F-35 fighters, the most advanced in the world, will make its air force one of Europe's best. For its part, part um, Sweden has also been strengthening its forces. Its military industry is so closely integrated with the United States that the US has even relaxed the by American condition for Sweden, basically regarding Swedish military industry as part of the US system. Both uh, Finland and Sweden have close relations with the United States and NATO. They participate in what are called out of area operations, meaning mostly offensive and aggression, despite pretenses including the Balkans and Afghanistan, uh, and they take part in NATO exercises. Uh, but that's not enough to protect themselves from the floundering paper tiger. So that's my puzzlement. So maybe you can explain to me what I'm missing. Well, uh, we could add to that another puzzlement, uh, a rather interesting uh, switch in the position of Swedish Prime Minister Magdalena Andersson. Uh, so I'm sure that you have followed the news. Uh, uh, at the beginning of March, uh, the Prime Minister said that if Sweden, quote, if Sweden were to choose to send in an application to join NATO in the current situation, it would further destabilize this area of Europe and increase tensions. I have been clear, clear during this whole time in saying that what is best for Sweden's security and for the security of this region of Europe is that the government has a long-term consistent and predictable policy, and it is my continued belief, end of quote. So this is what the prime minister said at the beginning of March. Then toward the end of the same month, we have a different position now. Quote, I do not rule out NATO membership in any way, but I want to make a well-founded analysis of the possibilities open to us and the threats and risks involved to be able to make the decision that is best for Sweden. And then at the beginning of April, uh, another position that there was no point in delaying analysis of whether it was right for Sweden to apply for NATO membership. So it seems kind of a strange understanding of long-term, consistent, predictable government policy. So to go from uh, something that sounds as a pretty uh, reasonable assessment of the risks of joining uh, NATO, in the case of Sweden, to actually almost admitting that that is the way uh, forward. And just uh, yesterday, to make the whole situation even more interesting, the head of Swedish security service, Charlotte von Essen, uh, said, quote, Russia may think that they now have a limited time frame to influence Sweden's decision on whether to join NATO. It is difficult to predict the nature of such a Russian influence attempt, but it could occur in many different ways simultaneously, so as to influence the media, public opinion, and decision makers. So it seems that there is from different governmental offices uh, a kind of a clear uh, shift from some different positions just a month ago to now uh, almost claiming that uh, any discussion that could influence the media uh, or the public opinion in a certain way actually risk to be uh, labeled as the Russian meddling in uh, in uh, Sweden's uh, uh, discussions and the decision of joining NATO. Uh, so uh, 
how, how, how does this situation uh, seem to you? Do you think that this shift comes primarily from internal uh, pressures that the government might experience from different political parties? Or is it maybe related also to external foreign pressures coming from primarily the US or NATO? Well, I, I'm not competent to talk about Sweden's internal political uh, complications. But uh, what's happening is very similar to the United States and uh, Britain. So take the United States. According to the United States, uh, Russian propaganda is so outlandish that anybody who looks at it would just crack up in laughter, hysterical laughter. Therefore, we have to protect Americans from any access to it. So all Russian outlets have to be blocked. Uh, we cannot hear what Russian leaders are saying because their propaganda is so ludicrous that if anybody listened to it, uh, they would simply crack up in laughter. Now we also have to cancel leading American reporters like Chris Hedges, former bureau chief for the New York Times in the Middle East and in the Balkans, long record of great reporting, a fine analyst, but everything of his has to be destroyed because it appeared on RT. And the Russian propaganda system is so powerful that it, we just have to protect Americans from it, although it's so ludicrous that nobody could possibly pay attention to it. Well, that's a little bit puzzling too. Uh, is it really sensible? Take the United States. Is it sensible to deny any access to what any Russian leader is saying? Well, look, it's a free country, so you're not totally denied access. So if you want to hear what Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, is saying, you can. Uh, uh, access uh, Indian television. And on Indian television, where apparently they don't feel they have to protect the population from this ludicrous propaganda. Uh, yes, on Indian television, you can read a long uh, a commentary by Lavrov, but Americans have to be protected from that. So we're not allowed to hear one word about what they might be thinking and saying. Uh, because we're so weak that we can't, Americans just have, are so backward and weak that they might be uh, overwhelmed by propaganda that's utterly ludicrous and ridiculous. Well, that's kind of puzzling too. Uh, not new, incidentally. Free countries, the United States is a very free country, have a long history of protecting their population from anything that might deviate from the party line. And it's quite important in free countries because who knows what the rebel will do if they have access to thoughts that are improper. You don't have to worry about that so much in totalitarian states, you just beat them over the head, you know, like they're doing in Russia. But in free societies where the state and the intellectual classes don't have those means, it's necessary to be super cautious. So there's a long record in the United States of censorship, not official censorship, just uh, devices to make sure that uh, what intellectuals call the bewildered herd, the rebel, the population, don't get misled, have to control them. And that's happening right now. Uh, could go, if there was time, I could go through the record, but it's nothing new. So that's puzzling. I mean, it's not really puzzling. If, if you think about what's behind it, it's not puzzling. Uh, but I think we can perhaps say the same about Sweden. Uh, there is a strange contradiction. It's recognized with great excitement that Russia has no military capacity at all. 
it's a paper tiger. Uh, it's never hinted at trying to conquer Sweden or Finland or anyone else. Uh, NATO is like other military forces, a an offensive military alliance. Of course, it's a great threat to anybody that's transparent, but we have to join it to increase tensions, to to protect ourselves from a military force that we agree doesn't exist. That's the situation. I leave it to Swedes to figure it out. But isn't it uh, really a rather uh, sad development for democracy and what is called uh, liberal democracy, especially not just in North America, but nowadays we can see also across Europe, even in Nordic countries, that uh, the prevalent understanding of democracy seems to be that democracy and freedom of thought are allowed as long as you choose the right option and as long as you think the right thing. Otherwise, if you have a different position following the implications of what the head of the security service uh, just said, everyone who might have a different position risks to be labeled a uh, Russian spy. I suppose everyone in this room uh, risks to end up uh, the same way. So that on the one hand, we have an understanding of democracy and the public sphere, which uh, tolerates uh, already established dogmas that are propagated uh, by the mainstream media. And on the other hand, there is a kind of self-perception and especially the government is very proud of itself as promoting democracy and human rights uh, uh, especially in other parts of the world. So just as a footnote to add to what uh, you already said in terms of so-called paradoxes of the systems in which we live today. It's true and it's, it's very striking and it goes way back, I should say. So let's go back to the First World War. Uh, couldn't go back further, but take the First World War. Uh, it's now understood by historians that this was a completely insane war. There was nothing at stake and nobody had any justification for what they were doing. But that was not the perception at the time. In all the countries that participated, the intellectual classes enthusiastically lined up in support of their own country. Uh, 94 German intellectuals published a manifesto to the West saying, you must support the country of Kant, uh, Goethe, Beethoven, uh, the most magnificent country in the world, of course, defending itself. It was exactly the same in England, France, and the United States. Now, there were a couple of people who didn't go along. Like in Germany, there was Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht in jail. In England, there was Bertrand Russell in jail. In the United States, there was Eugene Debs in jail. Uh, so yes, there were, were free countries you're allowed to object, but to tough luck, you know. Uh, that was, uh, we can go on, it's the same story. Uh, it's, uh, let's take England right now. I won't, something very interesting is happening in England. There's a political leader, Jeremy Corbyn, who uh, came out with a hideous comment, so horrible that he was virtually thrown out of the Labour Party. Take a look at the comment. He bitterly condemned for it. He said that, of course, this has nothing to do with the criminal Russian aggression, but after the Ukraine, issue is settled, we might want to think about whether it's a good idea to have military alliances like NATO, or whether we ought to think someday about moving towards a system without military alliances. In other words, should we pursue what uh, de Gaulle proposed for Europe, uh, Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals without uh, military alliances? or what Gorbachev proposed, a common European home, uh, uh, Lisbon to Vladivostok with no military alliances, or what President Bush 
proposed, the first President Bush, not the second. President Bush in the early 90s proposed a partnership for peace in which all of the countries of Europe could join. And NATO wouldn't be disbanded, but it would be marginalized, put off in a corner. You want to join it, okay, don't join it, okay. So that's essentially what Corbyn is proposing. That is so outrageous that he has to be thrown out of the Labour Party. Okay? That's what happens in free societies. Right now, I talked about the First World War, to talk about all the periods since, always the same. In free societies, you have to be super careful. Actually, George Orwell wrote about this in something you probably didn't read. I'm sure you read Animal Farm. Everybody does satire on the totalitarian enemy. But I would guess you probably ne never read the introduction to Phantom Farm because it was unpublished. Actually, I did. <laughs> you have read it. Good. I can. <laughs> <laughs> it's unusual. It was unpublished, found in his unpublished letters about 30 years later. Now you occasionally can see it. In the introduction to Animal Farm, he addresses himself to the people of free England. And he says, in free England, you shouldn't feel so self-righteous about the satire of the totalitarian enemy. In free England, unpopular ideas can be suppressed without the use of force. And he goes on to discuss it, uh, gives a couple of explanations. One explanation he says is that the press is owned by wealthy men who have every interest in seeing unpopular ideas suppressed. And the other reason, which is more interesting, is a general intellectual culture in which you have it instilled into you in the best schools, Oxford and Cambridge, that there are certain things it just wouldn't do to say. This becomes part of your nature. You wouldn't even think of them uh, because just not what's said now. So what you can say now is, and they do, you read the US press, they do say it at the liberal press. You say, Russia must be permanently isolated. Okay, finished. Or you can even read Russia Delenda Est. You can even read that. But certainly we can't hear one word of what they're saying. We can. I just did a study which interests me, I'll tell you. It's become a requirement now among right thinking intellectuals that when you refer to the Russian criminal invasion of Ukraine, you call it the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. You have to add unprovoked. Just out of curiosity, I did a Google search. Look for the phrase unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. In 30 seconds, it gave two and a half million hits. Uh, again, out of curiosity, I looked for the phrase unprovoked invasion of Iraq, 11,000 hits, all of them from marginal anti-war publications. Well, that's interesting in itself. It's even more interesting when you look at the facts. The invasion of Iraq was totally unprovoked. There wasn't a particle of provocation. Cheney and Rumsfeld had to resort to torture to try to elicit some evidence that Saddam Hussein had something to do with Al-Qaeda. Uh, even the vanishing weapons of mass destruction, if there'd been any reason to believe they existed, would have been no provocation. So it was totally unprovoked. But you can't say that. In contrast, the invasion of Ukraine was provoked that in this crazy climate, you have to add the truism that that doesn't justify it, but there was plenty of provocation that run through the record. It's recognized by the director of the CIA, former director of the CIA, uh, 
American ambassadors who've been protesting the provocation for 30 years, protest profit pro right to the last minute against Stoltenberg, General Secretary of uh, NATO, just announced that since 2014, announced with pride, since 2014, NATO, meaning the United States, has been pouring weapons into Ukraine, training Ukrainian officers, running joint military exercises with them since 2014. Okay, that's provocation. Uh, everyone recognizes that Russia has security concerns about Ukraine, obviously. Just think about Operation Barbarossa if you can't remember anything else. Uh, right through Ukraine with Ukrainian participation. The, uh, uh, the United States government last September published a policy statement. Uh, the American press has kept it from the American people. The Russian intelligence can certainly read the White House webpage. Uh, it says that we must continue, we must enhance our programs of moving towards military integration of Ukraine into NATO, joint military exercises, new weapons, an enhanced program for uh, uh, entry into NATO. Is that a provocation? Yes, it's a provocation. And it continued. The State Department has officially, officially announced that prior to the invasion, the US refused to consider any Russian security concerns. Okay, that's the State Department. So is there provocation? Obviously, but in a free society, every right thinking person must say unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but you yeah. can't say that about Iraq. Uh, yeah, to add yeah, sorry, go ahead. I'm just saying, that's freedom. Yeah. Actually, Mark Twain, great satirist, once said something clever about it. I can't reproduce his words, but basically we're saying that the United States has three wonderful gifts. Freedom of speech, uh, the understanding that you should never use it, you know, <laughs> and something else. But. <laughs> Right, so to add uh, a footnote to all you said, it's also uh, quite often to use a strategy of a smoke screen or some distraction. And I think very often uh, uh, this, uh, in this case, uh, the membership uh, in NATO is used to actually uh, shift the focus of public attention from some real issues, very real issues such as uh, growing tensions within society or growing inequality or inflation that nowadays is also going up uh, and all of these issues are not actually addressed at least not properly but of course then the focus is on let's join a military alliance as a way forward but uh, I would like uh, you to uh, reflect on, on uh, something on a concept that you also argued for and that is neutrality of Europe as a way actually that uh, uh, seems to me arguably would be a much better way to proceed for European country that uh, has a potential to lower tensions on the continent and contribute to lowering tensions globally. So also uh, Philippe uh, de Camp from Le Monde Diplomatique uh, and also you in, in some of your other talks uh, proposed or argued for uh, a neutrality of Europe, and also he specifically argued that uh, that the neutrality of Ukraine uh, also might uh, have been and might still be a better way better way forward. So my question is, I suppose, uh, why do you think that European states are not actually mm -hmm. taking a stronger initiative in this regard, and why, for instance, Sweden, which already is neutral, is not in the lead? Uh, when it comes to promoting the concept of neutrality of Europe, instead, it seems to be moving toward membership in one of these military alliances. Well, there has been a major issue 
in international affairs since the Second World War about the status of Europe. There have basically been two views. One view is the what's called the Atlanticist view based on NATO. Uh, Europe should be embedded within the Atlanticist system, which means the US gives the orders and Europe obeys. Naturally, the US has favored that. There has been an alternative view. The most famous proponent was Charles de Gaulle. Uh, Europe should move to become an independent force in world affairs, what was called a third force. Uh, again, what he called Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals, uh, developing as an independent force in world affairs. My recollection, correct me if I'm wrong, is that Olaf Palm also supported that. But uh, I know Willy Brandt did with what was called Ostpolitik. Uh, it, uh, actually, Macron, in his recent abortive attempt to negotiate with Putin, was pushing for something similar. Now, if there had been a single statesman in the Kremlin, instead of just violent thugs, they would have leaped at this opportunity. They would have pursued the possibility of a European common home, Gorbachev style. A lot of advantages for Europe in that, obviously commercial advantages, all these crushing difficulties that are taking place could easily be overcome. The natural complementarity between Russia, resource rich, collapsing society, and Europe, which needs the resources, obvious security reasons. So it could have been pursued, might have even succeeded. US was strongly opposed and uh, condemned this as uh, you know, Putin loving and so on. Uh, Europe made the European leaders, I don't know about Europe, European leaders made the choice of falling deep into the pockets of the United States. Uh, that Europe, it's important to recognize Europe's position. So take, for example, sanctions, sanctions on Iran, sanctions on Cuba. Europe strongly opposes them verbally, but it adheres to them. It obeys. You have to obey the master. That's Europe's decision. We hate it, but we'll obey. For security reasons? Certainly not. Uh, for reasons of subordination to power, which comes quite easily to European leaders, uh, European intellectuals, and so on. We can ask why, but it's a fact. So going back to your question, take Corbyn again. Your Corbyn's proposal to revive something like George H.W. Bush's uh, Partnership for Peace was bitterly condemned. Keir Starmer, head of the Labour Party, said he has to be excluded from the Labour Party. Okay, that's a free society where if you don't strictly obey the party line, you're not sent to the gulag. You're just dismissed, marginalized. Not yet, at least. Hmm? Not yet, at least. Not uh, yet. <laughs> uh, but uh, to, to just add to that, uh, in the article I uh, referred to before, uh, Philip de Camp, uh, he mentioned a survey, survey from 19, uh, 2019 done in 14 European countries, which clearly suggested that in the event of war between US, Russia, and or China, a vast majority of Europeans would prefer to be neutral, which seems to be uh, quite a reasonable position, but doesn't seem to be reflected in public policies. Actually, it's not a reasonable position. It's based on a misunderstanding of war, deep misunderstanding. If there's a war between the US and Russia or the US and China, we are all dead, okay? period. There's no neutrality. But in a certain sense, there is a, uh, this war is also 
uh, de facto a war, a proxy war between uh, US and part of NATO and, and Russia, of course, uh, done on proxy. the Ukrainian yes, proxy. Yes, US side. policy, which Europe is going along with, it's been formulated very well by some prominent analysts who are cast out of the mainstream, like Ambassador Chaz Freeman and others. US policy is to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. That's exactly official policy. Take a look at it. The official US policy is to use the Ukrainian war to bleed Russia. In other words, fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. The United States and Europe are engaged in a grotesque experiment. They're saying, let's push Putin as far as possible and let's see, will he slink away quietly in defeat or will he use the power, which of course he has, to destroy Ukraine? That's the experiment that European and US leaders are advocating. Grotesque, hideous experiment, and it's supported by the intellectual classes. Which brings me uh, to my uh, last two points because uh, time is limited and we all know you are extremely busy, so we won't take uh, more of your time than, than agreed. Uh, so do you expect that uh, this uh, proxy war in uh, Ukraine uh, could escalate into something like a, a conflict with nuclear weapons, given that uh, stakes are high and no side can actually afford to lose this, uh, this war. So it's not something to, uh, that uh, Putin certainly desires, and it's also not something that the West probably would tolerate. Quite true. The British Ministry of Defense, their spokesman just announced that Ukraine should attack targets within Russia. Ukraine should attack targets within Russia. He expressed his confidence that Russia wouldn't react. That's very comforting. Uh, another possibility is that if Russia Russian territory is attacked, they might react. For example, they might attack supply lines for heavy weapons from Poland to Ukraine. That means hitting NATO forces. Well, uh, NATO might react. It's a violent, aggressive alliance. They might react by escalating. We're off, then we can say goodbye to each other many other possible scenarios. Our leaders confidently tell us, oh, don't worry, we have it all in hand. Yeah, just like during the First World War, they have it all in hand. Which, and, and the subtitle of today's uh, event is the future of East-West relations after the war in Ukraine. So there might not be future after the war in Ukraine, but if there is, uh, do you think uh, are the US and uh, China, the only real uh, winners of, of that war, given that uh, Russia is likely to come out of it if it ends uh, without uh, the whole world being blown up, uh, uh, in a significant extent uh, uh, weaker, and as well as the rest of Europe, so that uh, the US and China might actually get out of it uh, with significant benefits. It's quite possible. I don't, I think much worse options are more possible, but this one is possible. Uh, Putin, in his criminal stupidity, has handed the United States the greatest gift it could desire. He's put Europe deep into the US pocket. He's reinforced the Atlanticist system in which the US gives the orders and Europe quietly obeys. Putin has granted the United States that wish. Oh, what about China? China's sitting on the sidelines. They're refusing to enter to try to facilitate negotiations. Kind of like the United States, except the US position is worse 
because the US position is to undermine negotiations. China's just saying we won't participate. Uh, I'm sure that the, for perfectly cynical reasons, Chinese leaders are probably quite happy to see Russia driven into their hands in a subordinate position. Russia is a country that's very rich in resources, not just oil, many others, minerals and others, collapsing economy, kleptocracy, uh, collapsing, but very rich resources and weapons production. That's what it can do. So if, if it falls into Chinese hands as a subordinate, part of the expanding Chinese Eurasian system, Chinese leaders are probably quite happy with that. Uh, American leaders are obviously happy with it. They are now insisting that the war must go on in order to bleed Russia. That's what they are saying, not me, okay? So they seem happy with it. The chances of this destroying Ukraine are very high. We all know, we all know that Putin has the capacity to destroy Ukraine, no question. Can carry out saturation, bombing of urban areas, it's all possible. Russia can't conquer cities on the ground, but it can destroy. And what the US and Europe are saying, well, let's see if he'll do it. Let's run this hideous experiment in which we see if we can push Putin to the limit and see if he'll just fade away quietly or maybe destroy Ukraine. Unspeakable experiment. There is an option, the option, there are only one. The option is negotiations, which will offer Putin an escape hatch, ugly but necessary, because that is the only alternative to destruction of Ukraine and possible nuclear war. Uh, is it without precedent? Not really. Let's look back at the history of Europe, savage, brutal history, but there are some bright spots. One is the concert of Europe in 1815, when the European leaders, who were not nice people, I wouldn't want to have dinner with Metternich, not my ideal, but they were statesmen. They recognized that they should bring defeated France, defeated France into an accommodation. So France was brought into the accommodation even after its effort to conquer Europe had been defeated. It was brought into the concert of Europe that led to a century of relative peace in Europe, not total, but by European standards, a very peaceful century. Well, that was statesmanship. After the First World War, you didn't have that. The victors in the First World War insisted on humiliating and destroying Germany. That gave us Adolf Hitler, okay? Well, we're now kind of duplicating that. We're not trying the statesmanship of the concert of Europe. We're trying the imbecility of the post-war settlement. We might want to think about that. There, if you look at the actual situation in Ukraine, there are two options, various nuances, but basically two options. One is a negotiated settlement, which will offer Putin some kind of escape. Ugly, but that's it. The other possibility is the grotesque experiment. Let's see if he'll just accept defeat and go away to face a war crime trial for genocide, or whether instead he will destroy Ukraine and maybe go on to a nuclear war. It's the second option that European intellectuals and leaders prefer. Is that intelligent? Well, I leave it to you to answer.
not in my mind. Thank you so much for that. I believe that we have still a couple of minutes. Uh, so if there are any questions from the audience here, people who are physically present here, this is the time to ask. I'll just ask you to come forward so that you can ask from here. So, hello, Professor Chomsky. Great to see you and talk to you and appreciation for the, the old works you have been done within the decades. I have always been a fan of you and following many of your works. So, so happy to talk to you. I have a question which is kind of like a personal question to you, but it's related to the, the, the current situation. And that is, given the fact that no, all of us are kind of, I mean, that the whole world is under the, the overwhelming uh, attacked by the mainstream media and everybody, I mean, all parties uh, are brainwashing the people of the world. And things that you just said is like the things that it seems that only you and few other people say. And people are sitting here, we are few people. And uh, I wanted to ask you, so how, uh, how, how do you feel that, I mean, do you see any solution that once uh, uh, the people of the world could be like uh, aware of uh, the, the current situation and how do you personally continue all these works when, when, when you see that the, the people are brainwashed over all of the, the dif different situations like this? I mean, how, 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 do, you, how, how do you have this uh, hope, power inside you that you continue all these things while you, you feel might, uh, you are alone or only some few people are following the, this truth. I think there's plenty of reason for hope. Over time, it's at every moment in time, it looks awful. But if you look over a longer period, there is progress. So go back to the 1960s. The kind of things that were said then in the mainstream are just unimaginable today. It's useful to look back. The activism of the 1960s, young people on in the following years, civilized the societies. There are much more civilized societies today than they were back then. Not enough, but if you look, if you compare, it's enormous. I could give you examples. And the same is true now. So take uh, the most important issue that we face, the climate crisis. It's going to destroy us. Well, there are plenty of young people all over the world who are protesting about it. Just gave a talk to go to Extinction Rebellion in England. They're ready to civil disobedience, anything that has to be done to break through the uh, unwillingness of the leadership to do something which we can do to save humanity from destruction. Okay, that's hopeful. Uh, maybe I can add an anecdote about Sweden, which is relevant. About 20 years ago, I guess, I visited Stockholm and uh, I noticed that taxi cab drivers were being super polite, very helpful. I didn't understand why. I finally asked one of them, why are you all being so polite? He leaned over and he pulled out a t-shirt, which he said taxi drivers have. And the t-shirt had a picture of me on it and a comment in Swedish, which he translated to me. It was something I had once said when I was asked uh, what happens to people who try to be independent thinkers. And my answer was, they end up being taxi cab drivers. Mm -hmm. like <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I believe other people want to ask you some question. Thanks a lot. So I think we have time for one more. Brief question. Yes. 
Hi, thank you, Professor Chomsky. Interesting to listen to you. A brief question. I mean, it's we're in a very kind of negative spiral and it's easy just to see all the complications and problems, but you mentioned one possible way out and that would be negotiations with Putin. Which actors do you see today in the political landscape that actually could contribute to something like that? Two countries, China and the United States. These are the superpowers. If they become involved, they could facilitate negotiations. China refuses. Leaders are apparently pretty happy with the way things are going. The United States not only refuses, but is acting openly and publicly to prevent negotiations. That's what it means when the State Department says, we will not discuss any Russian security concerns. That means no negotiations. Russia is not going to enter into negotiations if the US says we're not going to accept them. That's elementary. Okay. But they could move. Now, the framework for negotiations is well understood. It's in fact been repeated by President Zelensky a number of times, including again in the last March after the the basic idea is neutralization of Ukraine, meaning Ukraine will have a status like Austria, Sweden, uh, Mexico, neutral, sovereign, tied to the West, but no heavy weapons aiming at uh, the adversary, okay? Uh, no military alliances. None of what Stoltenberg has been saying has been going on for the last since 2014, none of that, real neutrality. That's one part. Second uh, is the question of Donbass. Well, before the invasion, there was a real possibility that it could be uh, implemented basically within the Minsk, Minsk II Accords, a high degree of autonomy within a federal Ukraine something like Switzerland, Belgium, not unknown. Well, the prospects are narrower after the invasion, but still not impossible. Some form of statesmanship could work out an arrangement. That leaves Crimea. Zelensky quite properly said, we'll have to put the issue of Crimea off for later discussions first settle this, 15 or 20 years later, maybe we can deal with Crimea. It's a very sensible position. US blocked it flatly, won't even report it, literally. It's not the first time. We go back a little. Uh, Zelensky was elected with an overwhelming mandate, about 70%, on a peace program, on a program to bring peace to Ukraine and Donbass, and he tried to implement it. In fact, he went to Donbass to see if they could work something out in 2019. He was confronted by violent nationalist right-wing militias, which bitterly condemned him and threatened him with death if he proceeded with this. If he had had the support of the United States, he could have proceeded courageous man. With U.S. backing, he could have proceeded. Nothing. U.S. would not back him because it didn't want a negotiated settlement. It wants to integrate Ukraine within NATO to the last Ukrainian. Okay. Now, after the invasion, prospects have narrowed, but it's still possible. In fact, in March of this year, couple of weeks after the negotiation, the invasion, uh, Ukraine, meaning Zelensky, did actually put forward a fairly reasonable proposal. I doubt if it was even reported in Europe, it wasn't reported in the United States, it wasn't backed by the United States. Well, if that's the European US position, there's no hope for negotiations. 
it's much easier for intellectuals to make speeches about how the twisted mind of uh, Putin, you know, caught up in nationalist uh, fantasies. He's so crazy, we can't negotiate with him. That's easy. That gets you praise and applaud it. Uh, and of course, the only way to find out whether it's possible to negotiate is to try. So therefore you have to be careful not to allow that possibility to be opened. That's what we're witnessing. Thanks. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, thank you, Noam, on behalf of all of us here uh, present in the room for joining us today. Thank you for your time. And uh, we hope to see you hopefully next time uh, on a similar or related topic. Okay, a more pleasant one, I hope. <laughs> thank you and have a great day.